through verse 20. You'll find these similar words. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, not, a, not the smallest part of the law will pass until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, that's important. When you hear Jesus say, for I tell you, that means you perk up your ears, you pay attention. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Father, in these next few moments, Lord, give us a strong attention span to hear the truth of your word. God, may your spirit, who has divinely authored this word, God, would you use it to open up our eyes that we might see you, but we might see your glory, and that, Lord, especially as we, when we think about the Old Testament today, God, would you use it, um, Lord, to give us fresh insight to the end that we might worship Jesus with all that we have. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you, you look at something, and sometimes the longer you look at it, you begin to see it from a different perspective. It gives you a whole new way of viewing what you're looking at. And you could find several pictures on the internet that um, it's just somebody who has a creative imagination and, and has a very artistic way of viewing things that they, they can draw these pictures that uh, sometimes, if you're not careful, they'll, they'll just make your head spin. But I, I, I put a few of these images up here just to kind of to, to show us how we sometimes see things from a, a different perspective sometimes. Now, this picture, how many of you see a, how many of you see a frog? How many of you see the horse? You see that? And look at it a little sideways there, and you see the, the face of a horse. Y'all see it now? No? Yeah, now you see it. You see it? Kind of like the, the eye down here is the eye of the horse. His mane is on the side, and his, his mouth is pointing up. There, there's, a, there's a horse there. Y'all still don't see it. Yeah, turn your heads this way. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it's just a different way of looking at it. You still don't see the horse. Well, I can't. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Maybe, maybe you'll see this one. How, how many of y'all uh, see the duck? Any of you see a rabbit? What? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a duck, or it can be a rabbit. It's just, just a different way in which you, you look at it. Now, now, this is probably one of the first ones I've seen. Um, go to the next one. What? How many of you see the vase? Mm -hmm. And how many of you see the two people that are looking at each other? Wait. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's amazing the, the creativity that certain people, they just have. And, and just depending upon how you look at it, it's the way in which you view that situation. And many times... Two people, we can see the exact same picture, but we see two different things. You know, sometimes life is like that. Two people can go through the exact same situation, and one person uses it as a springboard to, to, to really just to deepen their faith, and the other person will give up and throw in the towel. And sometimes we get in a situation, and we're so close to it, that, that we can't see the big picture of what God is doing ar around us. For example, uh, I put this picture on social media uh, a few weeks back, but when you drive up to our church, uh, all we see is, is, is 
what's right there in front of us. Uh, but James is not here this morning. He's in Florida. He brought his drone out and he put this picture. Now he took this picture of our church. But when you look at it from the bird's eye of view, our church is in the shape of an E. And it was intentional. Now, uh, Mr. Doug, he's here. It says when the, the church was built, they, they originally said that the, the E was for eternity. And uh, Miss, Miss Joan, what did you say it was for, you thought? Mama? Uh, Julia, Julia, I'm sorry, Miss Joan. Mama. Put you on the spot, didn't you? East, for the eastern sky. But you know, you would probably never see that divine picture of an E because it's you get so close to it. Sometimes we look at the Old Testament and we're so close to it that we miss the bigger picture of what God is trying to say to us in the Old Testament. We get stuck in the middle, in, in the middle, in the middle of the laws of Leviticus or the prophecies of Isaiah and Daniel, and we miss the big picture of the Old Testament. Every single bit of the Old Testament has got one thing. Jesus. I mean, it, it just really does. Every bit of the Old Testament is pointing us to this Savior that has come through Luke. Now, I didn't put it on the screen, but it's Luke 24, verse 44. Jesus has been resurrected. He appears to his disciples. He's walking with them. And here's what he says. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. And everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, they must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Some of you know this, that the Hebrew Bible it had three parts. It had the law in the first five books. Had the writings like Psalms and Proverbs, and then it has the prophets. That, that was the entirety of the, of the Old Testament. And Jesus said, every, every single bit of it, it's about me, ultimately pointing towards me. And that's the heart behind our text this morning. The text begins, and, and it's really the beginning of, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and, you know, like the Beatitudes or, or the introduction. And then it begins here pointing to the Old Testament. That's what Jesus means when he says, don't think I come to abolish the law and the prophets. He's pointing to the Old Testament. And, and then you see the end of the sermon, if you were just to turn your page and look at chapter 7 in, in verse 12, and it's the golden rule, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And so that's kind of the bookends of the sermon. And so in between, Jesus is going to say some things that the people that hear it, it's going to be really, really difficult for them to hear it. Y'all heard of the pr proverbial, like you got hit over the head with a hammer or things like that? What Jesus is getting ready to say, especially the Pharisees and the scribes, it's like you take a sledgehammer and hit them right between the eyes. I mean, it is just going to be really, really difficult for them to understand what he's talking about. And so he wants them to know that at the very beginning of his sermon, he is not anti-law. He is not anti-Old Testament. He did not come to destroy or abolish the law. Rather, what he says, I came to fulfill it. I came to keep it and explain its original intentions, which the religious leaders had missed over the years. He did not come to take away from the law. He did not come to add to the law. As, but as the, authors of the, as the author of the scriptures, he came to fulfill them. And so with that in mind, here's my question this morning. How should we view the Old Testament? I think Jesus answers that for us this morning. Okay, so just keep that in mind, and we'll come back to it. How should we view the Old Testament? Uh, let me begin by giving you a few examples of, of how we should not view the Old Testament. There are a couple of ways we see in this text, and we see it in our culture, that we view the Old Testament. Uh, the first way is... To think that the law is abolished or destroyed or done away with, okay? And so sometimes we, we look at the Old Testament, we, and, and you hear people say this, that does not apply to me anymore. Uh, we don't look at it like that. Uh, even as early as the second century, there was heretical teaching uh, popping up, eliminating the Old Testament. There was a guy by the name of Marcion. He took this passage here, and he literally uh, raced that 
from the Bible. I've already mentioned Mr. Doug, but he told me a funny story. Um, just this past, I think it was Wednesday night, uh, you told me the story. Uh, he, was, he was with the guy, and I think it may have been another preacher, Mr. Doug. Uh, but the preacher were uh, in, I don't remember the exact context, but they, they had taken something that was clearly defined in the scriptures, and they said, we're going to go against that. And Mr. Doug said, I don't have a scissor Bible. He said, what do you mean a scissor Bible? And he said, I, I don't have a right to take my scissors and cut that, that teaching of scripture out of the Bible. Amen? And we don't have scissor bottles, right? We, we don't have the right that we can, when we find something that we disagree with, that we can just cut it out like it didn't exist. That, that's what Marcion did. He took this passage and he said, you know what? I'm just not even going to put it in my translation. His, his, his teachers that came after him, his disciples that came after him, they actually changed uh, the intent of the passage. So they put it in, but they, they translated it this way. <laughs> They said, Jesus said this, I have, not, I have not come to fulfill the law and the prophets, but I have come to abolish them. Hmm. And, and see, that's not the way we look at the Old Testament. We don't, we don't read Genesis or Isaiah or the Psalms or Proverbs and say, you know what, that just has nothing at all to say in my life. But we see people do that in our culture. Everybody wants to talk about Jesus, the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the peace of God. The very few people want to talk about the holiness of God, the justice of God, the wrath of God. And that's even revealed in the New Testament. We want to do away with any parts that shows God being holy and wrathful towards sin, and we simply can't do that. Remember, we were looking, we looked at this just a couple of weeks ago in our in our uh, core class on just our foundations of the scriptures and, and the, our foundations of, of who God is, is the, we, we say it this way, and theologians say God is immutable. He does not change. And we, we don't look at the Bible and say it was the Father in the Old Testament and, and the God of wrath is, is Jesus in the New Testament and love and mercy and now uh, it's just the spirit that, that, is, that is in the world. That is not the picture that we have of God in the scriptures. He is unchanging. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament is the God of the world today. Amen? That's right. and, that, that, and that's what we're saying. And so sometimes when somebody says that, that I just want to abolish the, the Old Testament, what I read there, you can't do that. We don't, we don't have that right. The Old Testament is just as inspired of God as the New Testament is. And he says... That even the smallest parts of it will not pass away until everything is accomplished. Okay? So we can't abolish the Old Testament. Here, here's the second thing. We can't be a legalist and think that if we do everything in the Old Testament, then God accepts us. That, that's what the Pharisees are doing in verse 20. Uh, that, you know, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they, they, want to, they want to be the people that say, you know what, I've kept the law so that God will accept me. For my good deeds. And, and Jesus, and he's going to get there. He's going to say, you know what? You Pharisees, you hypocrites. You look good on the outside. But inside, you're dirty. You're rotten. And you're filthy. filthy. Now see, this, this teaching, in the next few chapters, it's, it's going to really get to the Pharisees. I mean, it would have taken them off guard. I mean, with the, and the Pharisees would have heard that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. They would have been like, wait, wait, whoa, what, what? There ain't nobody out here that keeps the law greater than, than what we do. We make it a point in our life to, to keep the law. They were religious leaders. They were the ones that everybody looked up to. But they missed the entire point of the law. God, he has never been interested in our conformity. And that is exactly what Jesus has been, is going to address in this sermon. You see, the, the Pharisees would have said, you know what? Man, I, I'm never cheating on my wife. I'm never going to get caught in adultery. But you know what? I can maybe look at pornography and that's all right. No, I'm not cheating. 
They would never go commit murder. They might pay somebody else to do it for them, though. It'd be okay. You know, we can't lie, but we might confess the truth a little bit. You see, outwardly, <laughs> outwardly, yes, we, we, we keep the, the law of God. Inwardly, no. Legalism is alive and well in our culture. Just as it is wrong for people to discard the law and say it's invalid, it's equally wrong for us to depend upon our obedience to it to think we're gaining acceptance to God. You've heard people say this, right? Uh, hey, man, you, you think you're, uh, you're going to spend eternity with Jesus? Yeah, sure do. Man, did, how do you know that? Well, I'm a pretty good person. There's none that is righteous. Not, not, not one. You, your pastor's not righteous. If you're in this room and you're depending upon your good deeds to, to gain access into heaven, as humbly as I can, I just want to say that you're not good enough. That's why we needed Jesus in our life. Well, we can't be a legalist. I'll, I'll go a step further. Oftentimes, legalism creeps in the church, and not because we're legalist about the scriptures, we're legalist about traditions. You know, you aren't right with God unless you dress a certain way. Mm -hmm. And man, if you don't wear certain things, then, then you're just not a follower of Jesus. Or if Man, if, if you're not using the King James Version of the Bible, then there's just something heretical uh, about you. Or heaven forbid if you play anything but hymns in church. Mm -hmm. And don't let it be on anything other than the piano. Legalist. We don't conform to that. Y'all okay? Two incorrect views of the Old Testament. We can't say it's abolished. We can't say it has to be kept to the fullest extent in order to be accepted by God. And so let's, let's move and let's think about how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. Because he says this is what I've come. I'm not come to abolish that. I've came to fulfill it. And so in other words, it's like he, he pulls out the original intent of the Old Testament. Now, I'd like to just offer uh, just several different ways in which we see Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament law. Uh, first of all, he, he, he fulfilled the Old Testament because he, he kept every single command of the Old Testament. Uh, there, there, and not a single, single commandment that Jesus did not keep perfectly. He was without sin the entire 33 years that he walked on earth. When John the Baptist when he didn't want to baptize Jesus in chapter 3, Jesus said, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, the writer of Hebrews, he makes this statement, chapter 4, verse 10, 15. For we do not ha have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Now listen to this, this phrase. Yet he is without sin. And his obedience was not like that of the Pharisees. It wasn't like he was just outwardly conforming to it. It was the attitude of his heart, perfectly obeying everything. You say, well, why is that important? He had to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. One sin, we talked about this Wednesday night, one sin would have disqualified him as a perfect sacrifice. Just like one sin makes us sinners, right? How many times do you have to sin to be a sinner? Just one, right? How many times do you have to tell a lie to be considered a liar? How many times do you have to steal to be uh, considered a thief? It just takes one. Now Jesus, as the perfect substitute for our sin, never gave in to sin. Number two, he fulfilled all the examples and all the prophecies. Think, just think with me of all the examples 
that Jesus fulfilled in the Old Testament. I mean, just start in Genesis. You have Adam. If you go and you read Romans, Jesus is the better Adam. And by Adam, sin entered to the world and destruction spread to all men. But Jesus, who is the better Adam, by one act of righteousness, many will be made righteous. Amen? He's the better Adam. Uh, think, think about the ark. If, if you were in Noah's day and you wanted to be saved, there was only one way that you could be saved from the judgment of God. Uh, you had to enter by faith into the single door of the ark and by faith trust that God would save you in the midst of that. If you want to be saved from the coming judgment of God, there's only one way. It's the door of the sheep. It's Jesus Christ. You have to by faith trust in him for everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Think about Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham. Abraham, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And you get to what Paul says in Galatians. This is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The only way that Abraham is a blessing to the nations is because the Jesus came through the line of Abraham and whoever believes by faith, what John 1 says, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Amen? And so just think about Abraham. Moses, Moses wrote that in Deuteronomy there would be a greater prophet that would come after him. Jesus is uh, the greater prophet that comes kind of like Moses. Back up to Genesis. I skipped one. Remember Joseph? You will not find a greater a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament than Joseph. Joseph betrayed by his brothers. Y'all remember that? He was, he, was, he was sold into a slavery by his brothers and there in Potiphar's uh, house. Uh, his, Potiphar's wife lied on him and Jesus was arrested. And, and then God just took his circumstances and God, God was just sovereign over the whole situation. And Joseph, being faithful there, was exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh. And it was through uh, Joseph that Egypt was saved from the famine and, and Israel was saved from the famine as well. You see the picture of Jesus betrayed by his own brothers as his countrymen Israel. He, he was lied upon. That's why they arrested him. Uh, he was uh, arrested there in the garden. Philippians 2 uh, said that he emptied himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Philippians says uh, that he, he literally became like a slave. Remember, Joseph, Joseph was sold into slavery. Y'all okay? But did you know that just as God was sovereign over what happened there with Joseph and God used it for the good of the people, God was still sovereign when, when, Jesus, was, when Jesus was fulfilling that better picture and when jo Jesus gave his life, God was meaning it for our good. Amen? Because through his righteousness, many will be made right. He, he's the better son of Israel. He's the better son of Israel. He's the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. That's pointing to Jesus. He's the, he's the, he's the son that is, that is born of the virgin. All of these things in the Old Testament, they find their fulfillment in this man called Jesus. Every bit of it, it's pointing to him. Number three. He fulfills the law by paying the penalty of the law. Tim Keller, he, he made this point. Tim Keller said you can, you have two ways or two choices with the law. He said you can keep it or you can pay the penalty for it. For example, what Tim Keller says, you, you can leave here, you can get down to Mill Road, you can get to the stop sign at Highway 66. You can either stop at that stop sign or you can run that stop sign and pay the penalty. If you stop at the stop sign, you've obeyed the law. All is, all is well and good, right? If there's a cop sitting right down the road and he sees you stop, uh, run that stop sign, he's going to stop you, right? And you're going to pay the penalty. You know what happens when you pay the penalty? It's done with. It's over. 
And, and that's your choice with the law, Tim Keller says. You can either obey it or you can pay the penalty. We're not good enough to obey it. Jesus was, we're not. But this, this is just the worshipful part, guys, and I, and I hope you grasp this. Jesus not only obeyed it so that you can, uh, by faith, receive his righteousness, he paid the penalty that you deserve to pay for. If we don't obey it right, and there needed to be a sacrifice for our sins. And that's why, I missed this one a while ago. That's why, like in the Old Testament, there was a sacrifice. They would take a pure, spotless lamb, and they would sacrifice it as, 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 as like a sacrifice for their sins so that they could be right. And, and then they would, Leviticus says they would take a scapegoat. And they would, the, the priest would come out, and they would symbolically lay their hand on the head of that priest. It would be their scapegoat. Symbolically, as they laid their hands on it, they would transfer their sins on to this scapegoat, and they would send that scapegoat off into the wilderness, symbolizing that their sins have been taken away. Are you okay? That's what Jesus has done for us. He's our sacrificial lamb, paying the penalty for our sins. Our sins, what Paul says, our sins on our account, they've been taken from our account like a legal transaction, transferred onto the account of Jesus. He pays their penalty. His righteousness that he fulfilled in the law by living it perfectly is transferred from his account. Are y'all okay? This is good. It is transferred to our account. That's right. And so we, we see the law here. Jesus fulfills every single aspect of this law. Hallelujah. Pays the penalty for it. He fulfills it he, in every way. He, he lived the perfect life. And then so we come back to this question. How should we view the Old Testament? I'd like to submit to you that when you, you look at the Old Testament, you look at it through the eyes of Christ. We, we don't view it without thinking and seeing it through Christ. We view it as, as a way in which we honor and love God with all that we have. Jesus did not abolish the law because in the law what you find is that which is pleasing to God. Now, are there aspects of the law that, that, that we, we are not under anymore like the... Like the sacrificial system, though, Jesus has fulfilled that. Like the, like the, the civil system, no, we, we don't follow that in the New Testament because of what Christ has done. But the moral laws of God does not change. And, and so, I can't see this. The moral law, laws of God are, are, are those things which show us that which is pleasing to God. Right? Because it, it, here, here's a good statement, okay? If you really want to love somebody and show them that you love them, find out what they want in their life and do that, right? Men, I'm getting ready to help you. Y'all know what Friday is coming up? It is Valentine's Day. For that special someone in your life, if you want to show them that you love them, you find out what they want, and that's what you do. Y'all better say amen. <laughs> if nothing else, ladies, y'all say amen. <laughs> Find out what they want, and that's what you do. Leanne didn't know I was preaching this Sunday. And so I asked her one day this week, baby, if you could have, just give me a, a three options of what you would really like on Valentine's Day, what would it be? And so it's like it was about asking where you want to get eat, just so you know. <laughs> When it comes to the law, this is what God says pleases him, and we do that. Jesus said, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them to others, he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. When we see the, the law through the eyes of Christ and, and, and we think that this is how I can please the one who gave his life for me, it changes the way in which we look at it. Mm -hmm. you, you know what else, when I read the law, what it causes me to do? It causes me to run to Jesus. I can't even keep the Ten Commandments. No. Just being honest. 
I don't always love God with all that I have. And, and I look at people like Moses, and I look at David, and uh, some of the Old Testament heroes, and Abraham, as, as inspiring as they are, it makes me realize that, man, I, I don't know that I measure up to their greatness. Right? I mean, I just, I, I don't know that I could be like Moses and go to stand before Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. <clears throat> you okay? I, I'm not sure I could have the faith of David and, and say, that's a big old giant. I think I can take it. I'm just, I'm just not sure. And when I look at it, it reminds me of what Paul said. This is my teacher that shows me that I need my Savior. And I, even reading it through the eyes of Christ, it causes me that I run to Jesus because I know I need him in my life. It causes me to worship on a greater level. And you see, what happens? Here's what happens. We run to Jesus, and we confess our sin. Man, there's a change. When I'm, I'm just thinking about our salvation. When I run to Jesus, there's a change that takes place. Jeremiah and Ezekiel wrote about it in the Old Testament. He takes our sinful heart of stone, and according to Ezekiel, he gives us a, a new heart. Jeremiah says that he writes the law upon our hearts, and what happens is that while we may not keep the law perfectly, we can keep the law with purity of heart. And so when you get to verse 20, when Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying there is it's no longer about outward conformity of the law. It's about whether or not your heart loves the things of God and that you're seeking to live for him with all of your life. I've, I've never noticed this until this week. Did you know that all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, it's ne Jesus never tries to differentiate between those who pray and don't pray, or between those who give and don't give, or between those who uh, commit adultery and don't commit adultery. He's always after your heart. Right? So just think about prayer. Jesus didn't, pray, didn't, didn't teach us to say, hey, you know, I know you guys aren't praying, so let, let me teach you how to pray. Uh, Jesus said, no, you guys are praying in the wrong way. You need to start praying like this. Uh, Jesus didn't say, you know what, hey, 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 you guys aren't giving at all. And now, this, this, let me teach you about giving. He says, no, you're giving, but you're giving with the wrong way. Let me, let me talk to you about the heart. Uh, Jesus didn't say, hey, I, I know you guys uh, are committing adultery right now. But let me teach you about this. He says, no, you've got the, the outward aspect of the law. But now, let me teach you about what it's really about. Hey, he never differentiates between those who are not doing it and those who are doing it. It's, it's always, in every single thing he goes through in the Sermon on the Mount, it's always about getting to the heart behind what is being taught in that. When you run to Jesus, what you find is motivation to honor God with all that you have. And it's not out of duty. It's not because you have to. It's because, it's because you've come to understand how great the love of God is for you. You understand, and you glimpse the glory of God, and, and you fall down in worship. And, and it's not that you have to, you have to do this and you have to do that. You say, I can't do anything else but love the one who gave his life for me. Amen. And Casting Crowns sings this song. I'm just a nobody, right? I'm trying to tell everybody all about somebody that what. Saved my soul. I agree with that song to some extent. But you know that the reality is, I am a somebody. I want you to think about this, and I'll close with this. If there was ever a person that was a somebody, it was my Savior. I mean, just, just in your imagination, to the best of your ability, think about all that Jesus had in heaven. Think about the glory that, you know, Isaiah looked and he says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, and, I, and Isaiah falls down 
Because he recognizes how sinful he is. Think 